Welcome back uh, to this analysis of the 2015-2016 budget and what this means to you, to me, and to us as stakeholders in the Kenyan economy. And we'll continue with our conversation um, by Kenyans taking part in bills and bonds for as little as 3,000 shillings. Ali Khan. I think I, I, I wholeheartedly love that idea. I think, you know, it's, we, we, we've been at the forefront of the democratization of finance with things like M-Pesa and all these kinds of wonderful innovations. And I think this is fabulous. The key will be the cost to transact, but I think the mobile phone has collapsed the channel cost uh, for investors. So I think it's a great step forward. And I think, uh, you know, one of the great uh, reforms in, in, that I think of in our economy was that shareholder revolution we had, Terry Ann, not too long ago. I'd like to see it reignited again. Uh, to have people coming back to the stock market like they did at the time of the big IPOs. And I don't understand why we haven't got many more IPOs. I think that's a great way to create trickle down, create a sense of ownership in the economy. So yes, big, big, big fan of that, of that particular reform, yes. All right. And I'd like to um, invite uh, Dr. Martin Odor to just take part in the conversation now. And we want to look at the banking sector. And we'd like to look at the banking sector. And of course, the cabinet secretary um, uh, proposed that core capital to go up in three years. That's, of course, by the year 2018 to 5 billion shillings. What's your take um, on what informed that decision, uh, Dr. Tim? Um, Terry, and I, I believe what informed that decision was that for, uh, for a long time, um, there's been a view that uh, there's too many, that the banking sector was very fragmented. There's too many players and a lot of them are very, uh, very small and therefore the capacity to, um, to finance big, inf big, big projects, especially uh, now that we are looking at uh, big PPP projects, uh, infrastructure, etc., was really not there. Um, and, and, and hence, and, and there've been uh, moves in the past, attempts in the past to actually raise the minimum capital levels. If you recall, you know, originally the, you know, you could start a, start a bank with I think 250 million shillings. Uh, it took a long time for it to go to 500, and then it took, you know, a, a very long time for it to go to 1 billion where it is now. The minister's announcement last week was that this should now go to 5 billion um, progressively, um, which means that, uh, so now 2015 is, is, is 1 billion. Uh, December 2016, it will go to 2 billion. December 2017, it will go to three and a half uh, billion, and December 2018, uh, five billion. The expectation, obviously, I looked at the list of banks, uh, you know, over the weekend or, or on Friday last week, and actually I noticed that uh, half of the banks, literally, because there are 43 banks in this country, uh, the bottom 20 or so banks, uh, you know, are below the two billion mark. Therefore, over the next 12 months, over the next 12, 18 months, they've actually got to find a way of reaching that, uh, uh, what, what the minister pronounced uh, the other day. And, you know, if, if, if uh, th this could result in a number of things, there could be consolidation where banks come together to meet that, uh, th that you know, those who actually cannot will have the option to, to sell and, and move out of the sector. Um, and there could be other, you know, variants of, uh, of that move. But, you know, I think it's a good move. Uh, I think it will encourage uh, the establishment or the coming together of, uh, of, of large banks. You, you probably are aware that uh, the ability of banks to do business uh, is actually a multiple of the amount of capital. So, 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 if you, so you can only take deposits uh, equivalent to an X multiple of, 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 uh, of capital. So if your capital is low, your deposits will be low, therefore you can only lend a, a lower amount than, than the contrary. So all in all, uh, a good move, uh, Teria. So are we saying that there is no sp space for small banks in our economy today? I mean, if we look at some of the largest banks in Kenya today, it is because of their story or the history that they come with that they are where they are today. So are we saying there's no space for small banks? I think there's space for, uh, if, if you want to accelerate growth in the economy, I think you've got to define exactly what kind of financial services industry you're looking for. So, there's, so, so today, if you look at the top, the top five banks in this country, um, you know, control a very large proportion of what's happening in that industry. But then there are these other 40 banks or so. So what are they doing uh, today? And I think that's the question. Now, we also have obviously a raft of microfinance institutions which probably play the role that you are asking. So, so if, 
if people uh, at, at a different level are looking for different kinds of institutions, those exist today. But, but what you are missing is at the higher end, more and more institutions that can actually play in that space. All right. And I'm curious, and I, I just want to engage with crystal gazing a little bit, so to speak. Um, we're at a place in our economy where they say Africa is the most attractive it has been for years. Um, with a move like that from the cabinet secretary, are we likely to see international banks trying to come in to partner or to consolidate with some of the smaller ones in the country? Um, uh, certainly, I would think so. I mean, already we've seen a number of uh, investments by, by private equity firms into a lot of financial institutions here. We've also seen uh, foreign banks, uh, you know, trying to, to make forays here. I mean, we've seen uh, some of the international players, some of the South African banks or West African banks in this region. And I just think that this is going to uh, accelerate that. You know, one of the things in our region is that everybody w likes to own his, his little piece of, uh, of the action. And this has been one of the, the, the reasons why this has moved as fast as it ought to have moved. But yes, the answer is that, uh, you know, there'll be a renewed interest, in my view, uh, of players wanting to come in and partner. Uh, and if you look at the insurance industry, this has already happened, actually. Over the last 12 months, we've seen a number of international insurance players coming in uh, and partnering or buying off some of the smaller insurance players here. And uh, there's nothing to say that that will not happen in the banking sector. All right. Thank you so much. And we'd like to open up the floor um, to questions uh, coming through. And we've got a gentleman who has a question. Please go ahead. Okay. My name is Anthony from Kabasid uh, as, a, as an accountant there. Uh, my question is regarding uh, uh, the, 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 the impact of the budget to the common uh, man, the common monainchi. I want to see a budget whereby we have the basic commodities, uh, for example, unga and maize for uh, being subsidized or being controlled, just the same way probably we do with the energy, the same way we have the Energy Regulation Commission. Can we have the same for the basic commodities? Because that is basically what the common man is looking for in the budget. All right, thank you so much. Any takers? Uh, let me start. Up. I think, thank you very much for that question. And I think Kenya has succeeded being a free market economy where the market system establishes the price. If you, if you notice, um, the Energy Regulatory Commission does an excellent job in the pricing of, of, of fuel, for instance. Actually, it works. Kenya in Africa was the only country that passed the, the decline in, uh, in, in global crude oil prices. If you go around Africa, for those of you who travel, will see that. But I completely disagree with wanting to control the price of unga and maize flour. Because you need to leave the market system to work. Because when you get into price controls, the only people you empower are the bureaucrats who, who set those prices. Because they start playing with dynamics and they wait for when the price is going up, they take advantage. When the price is going down, they don't take advantage. So we should not, um, I think we should walk away. We should, as much as possible, try to liberalize pricing. Fuel is, the right thing in controlling fuel price in Kenya is because the infrastructure is very constrained. So there's, a, there's benefit until when the pipelines are done, uh, maybe we'll then uh, be able to open that. But for commodity prices like unga and maize flour, I think they fluctuate. We should leave it as is. All right. Uh, I think I would agree with what Polycarp is saying. Either we're a liberalized market or we're not. We can't be both. Uh, and, and if you're going to start int introducing price controls on certain things and not on others, then, then the market is not going to work. Um, I, I mean, I think we had the same discussion when we talked about uh, interest rate uh, controls. Now, you, as I'm saying, you've got a liberalized market. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, the market should set the interest rate. But if government is going to interfere, then clearly the private sector is not going to be able to take it forward. All right. So it's a worry. Ali Khan, you want to say something? No, I, 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 I understand uh, what, what uh, you are asking because there's been so much volatility in some of these prices. And particularly for the common person, when so much of your disposable income is going on food or on energy, you know, you really feel it. I mean, you, 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 your, your, your pocket is crimped. So... I, I sympathize with, with the question. But I think if you look back at the history of when we put in price controls at the outcome, the outcome has not really worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all know the reasons for that. So I think given our knowledge of our own economy, we're better off uh, trying to bring prices lower in general mm -hmm. and not trying to regulate them too aggressively. 
Allow me to push this a little bit further, and Fred, yeah. I'd like to rope you in uh, just before we get into the next question. Was agriculture given sufficient attention, uh, you know, given the question from the gentleman? Well, I thought you were reading my mind there, but what I was going to say is indirectly the government is addressing the question of, uh, you know, uh, food security or even, uh, you know, the price. Uh, and, you know, one of the big projects is, uh, is the, you know, Galana irrigation scheme. So in a sense, they are trying to say that uh, if they address the cost of production or even subsidize, uh, you know, as they are doing with this scheme, then we'll have uh, food available, you know, uh, at a more affordable price. And also if they address some of the infrastructural challenges, the cost of energy, all these are factors of production. And if we are able to get them at an affordable price, then ideally the, the, the cost to the Mwanainchi should, should be able to come down. So yes, uh, indirectly the government is, is really doing that. But to come back to your question on agriculture, uh, I think there's still more that can be done, definitely. Uh, and and uh, if I remember the commitment by African governments to allocate at least 10% of the budget to, to, to agriculture, uh, we, we haven't reached there yet, so there's scope to do more. But definitely, I think the government is trying to tackle you know, uh, you know, the infrastructure and the cost of uh, doing business as a way of then uh, you know, enabling the Mwanainchi to, to, to get goods and services that are affordable. Uh, and for those who are you know, uh, at the extreme end of the, you know, the chain, then the government has come up with some you know, safety nets, uh, like the fund that they have uh, you know, for youth, for women, for you know, disabled, and so forth, so that uh, they can come in to really uh, you know, mitigate some of these uh, members of society who may be left out. All right. Thank you yeah. so much, Fred. Uh, let's open the conversation again. Please tell us your name and where you're from. Yeah, my name is Charles Gashoka. I am from Akakan. I am a finance coordinator. I wanted to ask a question on, uh, on, on behalf of young graduates. This is in regards to the recent introduction of Rebit on, uh, on, on intake of new graduates uh, for, for one year. I don't know how the corporate world views this in terms of is it going to be actualized and do they see any long-term impact into their businesses as well? Or that's the question maybe I, I would want to please. All right. Uh, just before we get an answer, we'd like to take the next question. Uh, My name is uh, Joe Watson Gakuo. I'm the CEO of uh, Upstream Oil and Gas Limited. And I would want to engage the panelists in, in, in regard to the oil and gas sector, uh, or basically the extractive, with regard to what the CS Lotish proposed in the, in, the, in, the, in the budget. I'm particularly keen to get the views of uh, probably Polycarp, Nikhil, and Ali Khan, uh, because there was an introduction of some fuel levy. And uh, given the 10 kilometer, 10,000 kilometer annuity program, that in relation to the fact that the crude prices have come down globally, seems to take away from the Kenyans the benefit that they probably would get by that particular status. The other one is with regard to uh, capital gains tax. And particularly, uh, I know it covered the transfer of shares and stock market, but there has been a discussion allowed the transfer of assets. When an operator is <coughs> a board, and I think we recently had that where Shell and maybe Polycom can explain further, bought uh, BG Group, who also have a college here in Kenya. How is that covered in the, in the, in the proposals that uh, uh, the minister said? And lastly, in terms of promoting local participation, whereby we, the Kenyans, can play a key and a better role in the oil and gas sector or the mining sector. Were there any maybe measures that we, we are not aware of that were introduced that would encourage each one of us maybe in whatever business we do? And uh, Paul Cap keeps mentioning logistics and, uh, and all that, that would encourage Kenyans to play a bigger role in the oil and gas sector. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Gakua. Typical Kenyan who asks, <laughs> say one, one question you ask for. <laughs> but it's okay. We'll say you covered up for four people who probably wanted to ask the similar questions as well. Um, all right. Who will take uh, the rebates question from the young gentleman before we go into... Um, let, me take the re let me contribute to the rebate question from the young man. I think this budget was very youth-friendly. Youth-friendly because the Jubilee government, when they came to power, one of their promises is they said they'll give business rebates. 
for taking in apprentices and interns. And for the first time, we've seen the minister pronounce himself to it. But at the same time, let me address all young graduates and, and, and young people who are coming to the job market today. I think it's not so, I think you need to take advantage of what government has pronounced and also change your, raise your attitudes, not improve them, raise your attitudes. Because most of the graduates we are seeing to hire come thinking that their degree is a meal ticket. They are very entitled to the meal. We want them to come to the job market knowing that their degree is a license to hunt. If they come with that attitude, we, we will accelerate uh, together moving forward. But it's fantastic and I think very many companies, you'll start to see apprentices. But good apprentices, not the ones who are entitled. All right. And of course, we'll come back to the oil and the fuel levy uh, question in just a moment. Nikhil? Uh, yeah. I, you know, this is an interesting one. Uh, there was a sense of deja vu here. Because if you recall when President Kenyatta was president, I uh, was, sorry, he is president. <laughs> <laughs> when he was finance minister, yeah. uh, he actually did announce a, uh, a scheme for uh, taking on interns. Um, I, he then said that there would be discussion with the private sector and we'll figure out how to do it. I think in, even in the intervening period he, he resigned, so, so we didn't take it forward. So you can see his, uh, he's pushing this now. Um, as to whether it will work and whether the private sector will take them on, what we don't have yet is the details of how this scheme is expected to work because we don't have a finance bill. So without the details, it's, it's difficult to say that, yes, I'm going to take 10 graduates next year. Uh, but I really think it's quite a good idea, given the heavy level of youth unemployment that we have. So uh, yes, from that point of view, if we can take them on and we can train them, it is much better to train them than to leave them on the streets. So if, if, but we must see the detail. The devil is always in the detail, Absolutely. which we haven't seen yet. Absolutely. Ali Khan? Terry, and if you look at like one of the strongest economies in the world, it's the German economy, and they've had apprenticeships since I was a young boy, because I, could, I, I learned German, and it's been incredibly successful over that period of time, proven, tested, and I think given the sheer number of, of our people who are coming onto the job market, it's a phenomenal number, there has to be a role for apprenticeships. I think this was the right approach. Um, I appreciate that a lot of our young people are of a different generation. There was one CEO who said to me, Ali Khan, they resigned by text. We've all got to learn. <laughs> We've all got to learn how to deal with these guys. Yeah. And, you know, they all want it now. They're, I think there is a, Polycarp was talking about that challenge to, to motivate these guys. But definitely, we've got good human capital. This is a proven program that's worked. I've seen it work. And I think it's a great idea. All right. Fred, do you want to comment about uh, local participation? Well, on the apprenticeship, uh, first just to say, I think it's a, it's a good move, uh, but it, it's, it's really a short-term measure because the, the period given is six months, and, and also the devil is in the details, so in terms of how the guidelines really work. I mean, last year we saw something, though unrelated, but almost similar with the tourism industry, and there was a proposal that employers should pay mm -hmm. uh, for you guys to go and leave. I'm not sure how many of you went on leave, you know, so, so it, it's the practicality of some of these guidelines that I think will, uh, you know, make the difference whether it really uh, makes a big impact or not, uh, but really it's a well-intended move, uh, you know, that notwithstanding. Uh, uh, in terms of local content, I think this is one of the major uh, government policies that are pushing, and so the minister gave some prescriptions in terms of what they're expecting to be included as local content in, in, in a lot of these uh, flagship projects, which is a good thing. So I think the challenge will be back to the you know, local players uh, you know, in terms of whether they have the capacity to be able to, to meet some of these requirements. And, and like I've said before, I think we also need to harmonize some of these policies because yes, the policy may be there, but the way it is implemented, you may find probably the requirements that they have for the local, you know, call it the small industries, may be the same as they do have for, for any big player. So, so that puts the smaller players at a disadvantage. So we need to harmonize our policies in terms of the procurement requirements, uh, in terms of the, the pre-qualification rules, so that we can give a definite you know, uh, sort of advantage to some of the local players to be able to co compete effectively. All right, thank you so much, Fred. Um, Polycarp, of course, uh, Gakpo asked a couple of questions about oil and gas, but I'd like <coughs> you to start 
uh, with the fuel levy first before we okay. go into the other details. First of all, I must, I stand to be corrected, but I'm still trying to understand the detail of the fuel levy. My understanding is that, yes, there is a three shillings fuel levy, which is to be directed towards the road annuity program. And it's a good thing, because if it's going, if it, it's, it's, it's useful, rather than introduce toll stations, mm -hmm. toll on the roads, what the minister is trying to do is collect three shillings for better roads. And we fuel, we prefer more cars uh, um, on the roads rather than less cars. <laughs> so it's, it's not a bad thing, really. Um, and then um, I also think on the oil and gas uh, uh, question and its link to infrastructure. Uh, I keep on saying God has a great sense of humor because we found our oil and gas in the poorest parts of this country, to Kana, and to access those places. Many of us forget you need roads, you need bridges, you need, so we need that infrastructure so that we can get the oil out and take it either to Lamu or take it back to Mombasa, out to sell it, and to other parts of East Africa. So we, we, we really, nobody should feel pain, paying these three shillings. The pain we should feel is when it doesn't do the job it's supposed to do, um, 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 I guess. Um, and I think in, in that way I answer the question. All right. We've got another question. Um, the first lady to finally ask a question. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Tedian. Uh, my name is Lydia Mungai. I'm the CEO of Tebo Sako. A comment before my question that uh, this year we were very happy as a Sako movement that now we are allowed to share information with the rest of the financial institution. And I believe that this will really give us a mileage in terms of uh, correcting our debts. Now, my question goes to the issue of uh, tax on rent, coming from an industry that really fads the hustlers, people who are trying to put up something, maybe to give them pension when they are, they are no longer working, and about the 12% on uh, tax on the gross rent. I would like to know how this relates with the service charge as these people keep coming and asking now, uh, shall we uh, charge rent differently and then service, uh, service charge so that we can only pay tax on the rent uh, and avoid on the <coughs> service charge? So we'd really like to know how that plays and the best way to advise them. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. Nikhil, do you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the 12% the on rental, uh, the, whole, the whole purpose of, of doing that was that uh, it is perceived that landlords are not falling within the, the tax net. Um, and you will recall, and in fact this again goes back to the time when the president was finance minister when they first started talking about rentals and they talked about mapping residences and, and commercial premises. And uh, you know, the, the, the point is this, that in most of the urban areas of the country, I would say that 80, 85, maybe even 90% of the rentals are probably declared, uh, maybe a little bit less. The problem comes when you go into areas like the slum areas, so Kangemi, Kangware, Kibera, uh, those are cash businesses. And there's huge amounts of cash that are, that are turning around. So what, I think what they were trying to suggest with this was that you may not be able to keep proper books of records and, and, and prepare a profit and loss account and work out your net gains. So just pay us on the gross basis. Now, you have an option. You can do it both ways. But they're, they're saying if you, if you if, if you can't do a net, net position, then just give it to us on a gross basis. The other part of that, which I think is where uh, there's going to be more attention, is that an amnesty has been granted. So what they're saying is that, and this amnesty from what I can gather, although this is not confirmed yet, anything pre-2013 which you haven't declared, they're going to forget about. Anything 2014, 15 forward, you pay this 12%, but they won't charge you penalties and interest. So uh, it, it's a way to try and widen the tax net and bring more of these people in. 
It remains to be seen whether it's going to be successful. But it does seem to me that this is perhaps the best measure I've seen in the last four or five years to tackle this issue. Now, on the question of service charges, um, I, I don't really know the answer, but I, it seems to me that, that service charges are, in a sense, very akin to rental because of where they're coming from. And, and I would think that my friends at the Kenya Revenue Authority will bunch the two together. Uh, but there's, one needs, again, to see the finance bill to see whether they make that, that distinction or not. Nikhil, if I can uh, push a little bit further on, on, on that question, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's sort of a turnover tax, so to speak. And um, for, when Amos Kimunya was finance minister, he introduced um, something similar way back then. So how, how do we know that it's going to work this time around? Um, I, I, I think the, the terms of this amnesty, uh, from what I can understand, it is actually very favorable to the taxpayer. Uh, and if you are an errant landlord, and I'm sure none of you here are, <laughs> but, but if you are an errant landlord, then take this amnesty because it's going to be in your favor. Uh, and then you come clean thereafter. Uh, and look, when you, when you evade tax and you get caught, the penalties and interest are significant. The possibility of spending time in Kabiti prison is very high. So, you know, you've got to take these things. And our biggest problem has been that, and I think someone said earlier, Polycarp, that we're fishing in the same pond all the time. And what we have to do is widen that tax net because we've reached a, a saturation point. I, you know, I often say to the KRA, look, if you come to my clients year in, year out, if I've made a mistake in year one, I would be stupid to make it in year two. So you're going to get marginal returns if you keep coming back to me. So we now need to go out. We need to look at um, you know, the wider, maybe the Juakali sector to bring them in. And, and on that one, you know, we're very proudly saying that we've, we've created 700,000 jobs in the Juakali sector. But it seems to me if we can count them, why can't we tax them? All right. Well, yeah. <laughs> I want, I, want to build, I want to build on what Nihila said and say, uh, using the tool of ITAX, which is, seems to be stabilizing, I think any landlords out there who have not been paying tax need to take this baton from the minister. Uh, the amnesty is a, is a very good tool, and we encourage the minister to expand the amnesty to very many other sectors. Mm -hmm. Because amnesties, if they can produce al-Shabaab, I think 85 appeared. Uh, after you give, how many taxpayers can appear. <laughs> but we're if, not Al Shabaab. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying, um, uh, but I think the amnesty is a good thing. We saw it work when President Kibaki came to power in the Grand Coalition government in 03. Tax revenues ballooned from 250 billion shillings to, to the trillions we are talking about today um, uh, in his government because he gave an amnesty at the beginning. And I think it's a good thing that the taxpayer, uh, the Tax collector is discovering a new tool in his toolbox beyond a hammer, you know? Good. <laughs> but, All right. But, Jerry, if I can say, um, uh, now is my plug because, uh, of course, the KRA is people that I've got to live with on a daily basis. They, they are, I have certainly seen a significant improvement in their collections. And if you look at uh, the collections of the last year, you'll see a sort of linear 45 degree line. The problem is that. If the economy is not ticking over as fast as it might, then that is going to start plateauing. So we, we do need to widen that net. Now, I think the other revolutionary thing that KRA have come up with, and I would encourage everyone to, 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 to use it, is the ITAC system. Because the ITAC system is going to completely revolutionize how you handle your tax. Uh, and, and I've already seen it. I mean, I, I, you, you miss a PAYE return. Within 24 hours, you get a mail to say, return was not filed, 10,000 shilling penalty within the next month. So it, it's becoming proactive. The use of technology will be much greater. We might see more text message resignations, but <laughs> nonetheless. <it's laughs> All right, you have to wind up now. So I'd like to take your final comments um, as we wind up. Perhaps we'll start with Fred on your side. Well, I think the whole thing about the budget is the minister tried to be creative in a sense. Uh, where he said, yes, I'm going to have an expansionary budget, but I'm going to, you know, cushion the lower end of the population and uh, sort of punish, if you like, uh, those who are engaging in uh, harmful activities, as he called it. And so 
uh, you know, we haven't talked much about it here, but you're likely to see a lot of incre increment in terms of excise duties uh, because he's basically trying to collect more money. Uh, he's targeted the property owners in terms of uh, the, the rental uh, income tax. So, so a lot of these you know, tax pains, uh, he's tried to push them to, uh, to, to those who have more ability to say, to pay rather. And, and so that's a bit creative. Uh, he's also tried to make sure that they adequately fund the, the key sectors in the economy, especially infrastructure, and I think that's a good move. So, so like we said before, I, I think uh, we wait to see how it will be implemented, and if it's properly implemented, then we should be able to see the positive impact going forward. All right. Thank you so much, Fred. Ali Khan, your final comment? No, I, I, I think it was a really constructive budget. I think if you understand the biases in it, then it, it, it's not as scary as it might look in terms of the revenue, year-on-year -year revenue increase, which is quite a bold one. And I think it touched on most parts of, uh, of the economy that matter. Uh, the only thing that I, uh, the complaint I got is that if we, if we feel we've made a mistake, there's no harm in changing and changing quick. And I think that's, you know, we can see a couple of instances where the capital gains tax, we've changed it, great. You know, the excise duty on Senator Kay, great. You know, it didn't work out, great, but do it quickly. Senator Kay took four years. All right. That's my only criticism. Thank you, Ali Khan. Mitchell? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think Fred and Ali Khan have covered it, but I have one major disappointment, <laughs> that we did not do anything with the personal tax bans and allowances. So we're now going into the 11th year at the same bans and allowances, and yet NHIF has increased, NSSF is set to increase. So the comment earlier about disposable income means in real terms, we're probably worse off. And I think there was an opportunity missed there for him to do something to really help the taxpayers and would have also helped with, with, with dealing with the price of unga and, and, and things that go around it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I guess that's a challenge to us now, uh, especially the media people, to try and push you know, to in, in, in the coming years for that. Polycop, your final comment? Uh, my final comment is to thank, thank the, the makers of the budget for thinking about tourism and being specific about rescuing tourism. Uh, and I think the local tourism industry has to look at how they market their product, especially to domestic people, a lot more. I celebrate this budget because it has allowed us to now carry over losses for 10 years. I think that's a massive gain for, for businesses because as we invest in CapEx to grow and grow our capacity, we've been allowed to carry over taxes in 10 years. And to close, um, I think for me is to throw a challenge to law enforcement agencies in this country. I think every Kenyan out there is saying it's too easy. There's no risk to being a criminal in Kenya. And what we have seen in this budget is a serious investment in law enforcement. Now it's the time for the law enforcement agencies to do their job. They must really deliver because when you look at the amount of money that has gone into the security docket, it's been significant. And if we do not have enforcement of the law, then everything else we are talking about, foundation of this economy is security. So uh, kudos to the minister. And he also had some great politics in the budget. I think, I don't know whether you noticed it, but I read it. Um, again, I go to my gas cylinder story. It's good politics. Um, you know, the investors in the gas cylinder are usually people on the, in the opposition side of, of politics. So I think, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so uh, on a light note, on, on a light note, I think uh, the opposition leader has gotten his pensions. <laughs> what a way to end the show. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I guess everyone is a winner this time around. Thank you so much. We've come to the end of this uh, analysis of the 2015 2016 budget where we've been unpacking the numbers just to find out what this means for us as stakeholders in Kenya's economy. And I'd like to thank my panelists tonight, Polly Kapigade. <laughs> Nikhil Hira from Deloitte. <laughs> Ali Khan Sachi, Rich thank Management. You. And of course, Fred Jumbo of thank Deloitte, you, East you. Africa. Thank you so much.